Tracy is a second year doctoral student at York University. She is investigating human American interactions and conflict in Toronto in order to develop strategies to support coexistence. Tracy is also developing a citizen science project so that Torontonians can share their observations and interactions with raccoons for further analysis and learning. She completed her Master's of Science in Geomatics at the University of Calgary and her Bachelor of Science at the University of Cape Town. So I think Justin did a really good job of setting up what I'm going to talk about today. So I'm going to be following up uh, on a lot of the research he's, he started and the other students and applying the, uh, the data and looking at it very much just within Toronto. So I think we raised a really good point that within the GTA we see, you know, really rural areas, suburban and, and, and more urban areas. And in some ways those should almost be investigated as separate uh, processes. So I'm going to be focusing on Toronto specifically and that's, that's kind of more of a, an area that has more similar type of uh, land use and intensity, and den uh, human density. So today I'm specifically talking about spatial patterns of human raccoon in encounters in Toronto. And I'll go through data and methods, uh, spatial patterns of home intrusion, so that will be based on Gates Wildlife Control data, spatial patterns of injuries and illnesses from the Toronto Wildlife Centre, and then draw some conclusions about the encounters. Okay, so first we discuss data and methods. Um, okay, so you're well aware that we have two data sets. One is the Gates Wildlife Control data. And this includes information about um, all sorts of species, but I'll be looking specifically at raccoons and mostly where they actually create den or rest sites within homes. Although Gates will get raccoons off uh, private pop uh, property, public property, businesses, I'll be focusing on those uh, that occur in the home. And then the Toronto Wildlife Centre, which includes injuries, illnesses, um, and orphaned animals. Um, so Justin already touched on this, but there are obviously a lot of challenges of working with this kind of data. It's not collected for research, so it doesn't necessarily have all of the attributes that we'd like. It's not necessarily consistently described. Uh, how incidents are reported is not consistently described. So it takes quite a bit of time in terms of actually uh, coding that into categories that we can work with. And so that's one of the uh, difficulties with the Toronto Wildlife Centre data. There's a lot of rich data there, but in terms of actually going through that and categorizing it into injuries and illnesses, it's a big job that we do want to do, but it, it's going to take some time. Um, and then that was the point uh, that was brought up earlier about selection bias. Obviously, uh, we don't know for sure who calls Gates Wildlife Control. It's the type of person who cares about animals more and wants a humane solution. Um, or does anybody call Gates Wildlife Control? And similarly with the Toronto Wildlife Centre data, um, does anybody call Toronto Wildlife Centre or is it only particular portions of the public that uh, calls the Toronto Wildlife Centre? So the data may have a selection bias. And then we have no base rates to compare it to, so uh, that was also mentioned earlier, we don't know all the cases where um, raccoons may have been occurring but they weren't encountered, or they were encountered but they didn't call Toronto Wildlife Centre or Gates Wildlife. So there, there is definitely the possibility of supplementing this with further research, so actually doing field work on the ground and surveying people to find out which companies they did call or uh, when they encountered raccoons did they call Toronto Wildlife Centre or not to get some kind of comparison of regions. And um, also, I mean, of course one could also try and do some on the ground work say with raccoons trying to figure out the population density of raccoons or the actual mortality rate and causes in a region, but that's that is a very difficult project. <laughs> um, a lot of advantages, okay, so we have the actual human wildlife encounter, which is, if we're looking at coexistence and conflict, that really is what we're interested in, is when these two come together. And it's collected over a large area and a long time period. So most research projects get a couple of years funding, um, and we know that most uh, patterns happen over a longer time scale. Um, so it's really great that we can have access to this data uh, for free and do all this research. Um, I see another advantage of it that it's not driven by the researcher's preconceived notions. So we can actually look at the data that uh, practitioners find useful and, and find surprising things there. And that's really great for exploratory analysis. Um, so really looking for patterns and particularly if we 
Um, because this data can be geolocated because it has address information, then we can overlay it with other map layers and census tract data and look for correlations between variables. And that's really great for generating hypotheses and doing further research. So it's really um, it's a great place to start. Um, so the methods are used um, to look at um, encounter rates for injuries and illnesses is quite straightforward. So, and Justin uh, mentioned it too. So we counted the number of encounters per neighborhood uh, within Toronto. And then we also calculated the number of people and the number of dwellings per neighborhood using the census uh, statistics from 2011. And then I also worked out the intrusion intensity, which is the intrusion, number of intrusions per 1,000 dwellings. So I measured that per dwelling because that's really the unit we're interested in. And then when it comes to injuries and illnesses, it was the number of injuries per 1,000 people. So since that it would be people who are the ones who actually notice an animal that's sick or injured. And then I went a step further and wanted to really pull out those areas that, or those neighborhoods which are kind of hot or have a high intensity of intrusions or a high intensity of injuries and illnesses and those areas that are cold for comparison. And specifically looking at clusters of neighborhoods. So that what it's an algorithm at the bottom, it's local Moran's eye. And basically what it does, it looks at a neighborhood and the neighbor that neighborhood's neighbors and to, to determine whether that whole group is significantly above average in terms of the number of intrusions or significantly below average in terms of the number of intrusions. So once we have these hot spots and uh, cold spots pulled out, we can really compare them to try and find out uh, what are the differences between those regions. So we've looked at the data and now I'll show some maps of home intrusions. Um, so for the Gates Wildlife Control, over 19,000 points were raccoon points, so that was obviously the most common uh, species encountered. And we can, can convert those points into a density map uh, or heat map, and it shows this clear pattern that obviously you know, we have higher uh, density towards the core of Toronto. But even within Toronto, over here I have in the lower right, um, you see that it's not, it's not homogenous, that even within Toronto you see variations in the actual density. So there's a strong kind of signal uh, going sort of north, south, and then east into the beaches. Um, so just a reminder of the human population map. Okay. So what I did then is uh, looking specifically at um, the intrusion density per unit area, and that's supposed to read is, and the intrusion density is roughly correlated with human density. So I'm going to put them next to each other. On the left hand side, it's the human population density, so this is by area, and on the right hand side in green, you have the raccoon population density. So there definitely is um, some correlation between them especially in the central regions between um, the Humber River and the Don Valley River. So on the west, this is the Humber, and over here is the Don Valley. And then, of course, this is all kind of south of the 401, which really seems to be quite a, a, a dividing line within the city. Um, but dwelling density by itself does not seem to explain all of the variation. So when you actually divide the number of intrusions by the number of dwellings, so this is number of intrusions per house, um, you see a very strong pattern. So if it, was, if it was exactly correlated, this map would kind of be very homogeneous. But we see this very, very strong pattern um, occurring in the north, roughly north-south direction of Toronto. Um, so I'm putting it next to the human density so you can compare it and you'll notice here uh, that this is an area of pretty much relatively low human density in the circle but on the right hand side this area pops out as a high uh, intensity for uh, raccoon intrusions into homes. So there is something else going on there besides a simple correlation with, with human density and then similarly here we have the opposite where we have a high human population but it's not the area of the highest number of uh, raccoon intrusions. <coughs> and then this is the hot spot and cold spot map. So the red areas here, sorry, the red areas here indicate uh, high intensity of home intrusions. 
Um, so we see here this is the 401. It's really quite a clear dividing line and then the Don Valley sort of hugging the Don Valley River all the way to the south and here going over into the beaches on the east side and then a very significant cold patch in the northwest of Toronto. So I am going to zoom out for a bit uh, into the greater Toronto area just to show that this does really uh, pop out in terms of the overall region. So there's Toronto core and those hot spots. So the whole of Toronto Central Toronto really is a hot spot, but even within Toronto, when we zoom in, we see that different areas pop out. Um, so where do raccoons actually make dens in houses and how are they specially distributed? So we're interested in this question because it points to kind of what are the preferred denning sites that raccoons might have in a house, um, and also which parts of the house or home are typically vulnerable and it also um, we were interested in this question because Brad mentioned earlier that it might be that there is a learned behavior uh, as he's noted that in certain areas he seems to, to see a distinct pattern of how raccoons are entering the houses and then where they uh, den. So I'm not looking specifically at location of how they get into the home at this stage that will be the next step but I am looking at where they are denning in the house. So the first step was to classify uh, Bradley as collecting all this information exactly where raccoons were found in the house and so that had to be uh, coded into categories. And what we find are the by far the most common place that raccoons are found are within the attic and then followed by the chimney and then under deck and we have also roof, garage, soffit, addition, deck roof, etc. So we also have a power law here. <coughs> okay. So there is a both overlap and difference in the distribution of den sites. So here we have how attics are distributed across the city. Um, and then how we have chimneys, so it looks pretty different. So we have, like for example, the attics are much higher uh, intensity here in the northeast than chimneys. And then uh, decks, and it's also interesting that decks have far lower um, intensity here in the uh, northwest. Now, of course, it can raise the question that perhaps that's due to the actual buildings that are available to raccoons to nest in. And so that's something we would have to rule out before saying that it's some culturally learned behavior. Um, but this is certainly the, the starting point for noticing that. And then also just to note that uh, Brad told me that certainly the, the dens, different den sites are used at different times of the year. So we find attics and chimneys would be preferred in the winter and the decks would be preferred uh, in the summer under, underneath the decks. So there is a seasonal component. And then here we find the hotspot cold spot analysis. So you can see it really pulls out those areas that are the same and those areas that are different uh, between the different intrusion sites. So those can be certainly areas where you can start uh, focusing uh, research and com comparing and contrasting uh, hotspots and cold spots. Okay. So we looked at the patterns of home intrusions and now we can look at patterns of injuries and illnesses. Um, so there were just under 2,000 points for raccoons in the Toronto Wildlife Center data and then as Justin said these were geolocated to the nearest major intersection. Um, yeah, and so that kind of presents a challenge because they're all falling exactly on the corner of four rows which is often in the middle of uh, four neighborhoods, so I had to kind of split those up to, to spread them around. But anyway, we still see the same pattern, uh, increased density into the center of Toronto and then uh, pockets of increased density within Toronto. Um, so here we have a comparison of injury and illness versus human density. So this is the in density of injury and illnesses in Toronto versus human density. And there is a there is a similarity, but again, it's difference. And what's noticeable is that here, uh, this is just abutting the Humber River. It's not particularly high human uh, density, but we do see a high density of injuries and illnesses in that region. So that's definitely something to explore. And then, of course, here as well, in the northern part, just below the 401 highway. And then, of course, this massive uh, cold spot in the northeast. So again, why, why is that? And is that just because nobody's calling them in? Or is there a lower injury rate? 
So if we look at the hotspot cold spot analysis, so this really pulls out those areas that are statistically significant, and we do see a strong pattern of higher injuries and illness rates um, along the east-west corridor of Toronto, and this, this horizontal line is more or less Bloor Street, so we have north of Bloor and then west of Western Road, a high intensity of injuries and illnesses. And then if we compare injuries and illnesses with intrusions, so intrusions on the right and injuries and illnesses on the left, we do see that the patterns are quite different. So we have like much more north-south orientation uh, over here for intrusions, whereas the injuries are more roughly east-west. Um, and that really points to the fact that there are, again, this idea that there's different drivers behind uh, the injury and intrusion maps. It's not simply correlated with human density or simply correlated with raccoon density because if it were correlated with raccoon density, we'd expect those maps to be identical, which they are not. Okay, so we've analyzed those spatial patterns of human raccoon encounters and I'll just come to some conclusions. So um, basically, the clusters of human raccoon encounters at a large scale are most definitely are correlated with human density. But uh, when we actually zoom in, we see that there are, there are significant variations. And the, this is most played out when you look at how injury and illnesses differ from patterns of home intrusion. Um, and this really provides a good starting point to look at what are the, the potential reasons or drivers behind those patterns. So we can, we can collect data specifically in hot spots or cold spots. Or as was mentioned earlier, we can do a regression analysis where for each of those neighborhoods, we can look at land cover, land use data, road networks, um, uh, rivers, as well as socioeconomic characteristics, and we can actually conduct field surveys where we actually go door to door and start to find out about uh, what people think or have done on the ground. And, um, and what is really critical too is actually having conversations with the organizations who generated this data. So I have started that with Brad, he's provided valuable feedback in terms of how can we, how, how to interpret the data, what might be behind it, and and what other further questions should we explore. And uh, the next step will be to go to Toronto Wildlife Centre. And the, the other thing with the Toronto Wildlife Centre will be really great when we actually break it down by injury and illness type and see how those vary across the city because that would be uh, really interesting to see if there are particular types of risks that uh, vary across the city. And then, yeah, thanks, thanks to everybody who helped. And then, uh, Brad, Brad Gates and Gates Wildlife Control for contributing data in Toronto Wildlife Center for all the data they collected over the years. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. So the floor is open for questions. Hi, Tracy. Really fun to see all this data. Um, the intrusion hotspot data map. The, yeah, just one of those. Uh, it, uh, my biggest thing is that it shows the Leslie Street spit and the Portlands, and those don't have houses. So oh. can you talk to me about why that's why showing up oh, over here as okay. red? Yeah, well, this actually, uh, to be honest, this data includes, I said home intrusions, it includes all of the data. So, oh. so it's this one here when I broke it down into attics, and chimneys, then that would be focused on the homes. But this is actually of the entire. So that, yeah, I realize I shouldn't have said it should just be intrusions. Okay. So it includes the entire data set. So that definitely is, um, and it depends also what the spatial boundary is there, because I think that poly that polygon might go up as well. Okay. Yeah. So it sort of includes the whole spit, but it actually goes up and includes. A part north of that. Yeah, well. it just jumps out at you because yeah, you know yeah, that that's a wild. Yeah, yeah, that's you know, a so cartographic thing. Really, and yeah. then the other thing yeah. um, that I guess Joanna might have something to say about this, but when you're exploring um, further analysis, that the city has all these data on homes and home right. age and yes. stuff like that, and maybe you can also be mining that for yeah. analysis. Yeah, absolutely. I think Brad was the one who mentioned that so these, the older houses are the ones that are more vulnerable. So if we can uh, relate that to maps of home age, that would be really fantastic. Yeah. So I wanted to uh, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask if um, it's specifically about addicts. Um, mm -hmm. 
if it include if the attic spaces are just in an actual uh, house, or does it include like a garage or things like that? Right. Because um, well, you yeah. obviously know what, what yeah. that would entail. <laughs> right, and that's actually this. It's that's what's challenging about actually classifying the data into categories. So. Um, sometimes the attics are over garages and sometimes they're over homes and so should those things be treated as the same thing or should they be treated as different things and sometimes there are den sites in garages uh, so should garage den sites be lumped together with uh, garage attics so that kind of like how to group the data together into categories is definitely um, a challenge and I think it's a feedback process so I, I should I'll keep the conversation with Brad in terms of like going in terms of how to um, group those together. So the way I had done it is I grouped together garage, I think garage and home addicts, but it could be it could possibly be a separate category. Yeah. Thank you, Tracy. That was great. Um, just occurred to me some of your cold spots. Um, I know that the area by the zoo really well. Yeah. And I know that in Pickering and around the zoo, mm -hmm. they're, they're not recommending to call Toronto Wildlife Center. So there okay. are other wildlife centers yeah. that they do call. So it's right. not that these yeah. folks aren't calling with injured wildlife, they're actually just calling someone else. Right. Yeah, yeah, that's, I mean, exactly. I think that's one of the things, the problems, so the challenges of using this data is that we don't know how many calls are actually going out and we're getting only a subset of that. And I don't really know how else to correct that except for by going into areas and actually finding out, like surveying people there and finding out who are they calling. I can, well, yeah. you, if you look on the websites for right. the, the city, so the city of yeah. Pickering, for example, which I just checked because I was hoping I wasn't yeah. making this up, they actually recommend other mm -hmm. centers. Sure. So if yeah. you are a homeowner, you would go on the website and phone those right. other places. Yeah, that's really, that's really valuable. So I think like immediately having the hotspots and cold spots it gives us a starting point where we might look further and then we might find out actually you know, there's another there's another, another driver behind the pattern that we're seeing. And there. I think that's the case for the Northwest as well, right. that they would call okay. elsewhere. Yeah. So we don't want to think that these folks are yeah. just not compassionate. No, 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 not to call them. Yeah. Any other questions? I guess the question is how do you make I guess I just realized um, the danger is not just thinking that they're compassionate, but thinking there might be some kind of safe zone mm -hmm. yeah. for coming yeah, to the exactly northeast hurt. when it might be like the most dangerous place of all, and they're just calling it. Yeah, just make sure you don't make this public so the recruits don't find out. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> they all, they all go to the so It's a cold spot there. <laughs> Yeah, I think these are really, I mean, these are these are really some of the fundamental challenges of using this kind of data that's that's kind of already existing but hasn't been collected in a, in a scientific manner. So then the question is, is it totally useless or can we still use it for, it, that's why I say exploratory analysis, but not, not definitely not the final word um, on what exactly is going on. <laughs>